Recently, I made a video on Aaron Beauregard's playground. I received so many nice comments from you guys, so before we start this video, I want to thank you for all the lovely things you have to say about it. You all got me blushing, you all got me kicking my feet, so really, thank you. Even though I didn't like the book, I actually enjoyed the process of making that video. One of you said it was like sharing a book club with a friend, which describes how I feel perfectly. I didn't read the book with the intention of making a video, but after I read it, I just felt like I desperately had to talk about it. You know, my best friend is way too squeamish for it, so I couldn't tell her. I was scared she would reach through the phone and stuff her wet socks into my mouth. I, 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 I don't want wet socks in my mouth. So the playground video came to existence, and you gave me lots of compliments for it. So in return, I'm giving you a second video. I'm giving you the slob by Erin Beauregard. The slab was already mentioned by some of you and I decided to sacrifice myself for you once again. I had an easier time writing the script for Playground because at least there were puzzles to be solved so I could divide it into sections but what this one is a bit different. There's a lot of this happened and then that happened going on, it's really not my fault, it's the book, I swear. But this is how things are gonna go in this video. We have three parts. First, I'm gonna tell you what the book is about in case you haven't read it. Then we're gonna talk about the similarities between the slob and playground because they're just way too many to ignore. And lastly, we're gonna discuss this book's sins. There's a lot to talk about. Please, please read the content warnings. They're on the screen right now. I know some of you just listen to these kind of long videos in the background, but please take a quick look now. This book contains so much more violence than Playground. Just be responsible, okay? Okay, great. Let's just, let's just freaking do this, man. Let's go. The book starts with our main character, Vera, describing the pain she's experiencing. The pain she feels is so severe that it puts her in sort of a trance and she starts reliving everything that's happened to her. Vera grew up differently than most people around us, and she came to the realization of that at the early age of five. Her family's living conditions were less than subpar. They're not exactly clean people, and even though it's not mentioned in the book, the correct term to use to describe them would be hoarders. The house Vera grew up in was always filthy, with rats and cockroaches roaming free inside, trash in every corner of the place, with moldy walls and ceilings, with random stuff decaying on the floor, the house was truly an entity on its own. Things like that have a snowball effect, and it's hard to stop the ball once it starts rolling. Vera grew up in that house with a World War II veteran father, a mother who works full-time to take care of the whole family, and a sister, Lisa, who suffered from bipolar disorder. Vera describes her older sister Lisa as scary to be around. Vera and her parents live their lives walking on eggshells so to not upset Lisa, who could become violent with the snap of a finger. The walls of the house had holes in them, most doors had broken handles, sharp cutlery were removed from the kitchen so that Lisa couldn't hurt them, but also that hopefully Lisa couldn't hurt herself. Lisa's attempts at ending her life wasn't a breeze to handle for the family either. It wasn't an easy life by any means, but things changed a little when Vera developed a type of OCD. She became obsessed with cleanliness when she was just a small kid. It was after an incident with a cockroach that slipped into her lunch bag unnoticed. She felt embarrassed that there was a cockroach chilling with her food, and she was also scared that her peers would find out about it. You know how kids are. They never let things like this go. So that day was the day Vera swore that she would fix her life starting from her home. She cleaned every corner of that house. It took a lot of convincing of her parents to throw things out. It took her years to do it, but her home was finally clean. Vera succeeded, but so did her sister Lisa. Her mother found her dead with a gun next to her bed. When Lisa finally died after so many failed attempts, they all took a deep breath which filled their lungs with shame because it felt good to put their feet on the ground for a change. Cleaning Lisa's room after the incident was up to Vera, and she did. Vera cleaned her sister's room inch by inch, making anything that could be a reminder of what horrible thing happened in that room disappear, except for the rug. It didn't matter how much Vera scrubbed, the rug was determined to hold on to Lisa. That rug was the only thing Vera failed to clean. 
Years later, in her 30s, Vera started volunteering for Alcoholics Anonymous, where she met her husband, Daniel, who is also a war vet, Vietnam. Daniel was born during the age window that made it possible for him to be one of the last people who got drafted in the U.S., and on the last day of the war, he took a shrapnel to his spine and became paralyzed, waist down. It was as if the perfect storm took over his life and all Daniel could do was swing around helplessly. When Vera first took a glance at Daniel, she was done with. Daniel might be the one with wheels, but Vera was the one entering his life like Lightning McQueen. Vera thought Daniel was really similar to her dad, both being war veterans with disabilities and both being alcoholics. Vera couldn't fix her dad, so she would fix Daniel instead with countless bad jokes. What follows is Daniel proposing to Vera, then them getting married, and then them getting pregnant. Did you know that Vera got pregnant during a steamy sex session while they were watching Fatal Attraction? Yeah. Yeah, he shot his seeds inside her, the same moment as Glenn Close climaxed in the movie. You're welcome for that crucial detail, we would have hated to miss that. When Mary was recently pregnant, the perfect storm that was gonna take over her life knocked on the couple's door. It was a vacuum salesman who looked and smelled like he spent way too many nights on a bar table hanging out with guys named Jack, Jim, and Pam. Pam, 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 you're not supposed to be here. No, go away. Oh, you're ruining it. The guy was selling Bizzle self-contained 1632 model vacuum. After the man demonstrated how good the machine was at cleaning on one of her rugs, Vera was already reaching for her wallet. We know clean rugs is her weakness, she has trauma, but affording the expensive vacuum on a disability compensation and a part-time hotel maid salary was still going to create a dent in their finance. But of course, Vera had a plan. Before the salesman left, she asked for his card and called the number of the company he worked for immediately. She thought that a young female vacuum salesman can actually be more successful than a hungover middle-aged man, and she proved herself right in a short time. Through her first and second trimester, she carried her bizzle everywhere and became a successful door-to-door -door salesman, which is a career you can only succeed at in fiction. Selling to women was already easy, but even selling to men wasn't a challenge for her. A little smile, a little winky-wink, the men would start paying. Vera was so good, she could even convince those men to screw the vacuum in front of her if she wanted to. We have no knowledge at this time whether or not she's ever asked a man to do that for her, but our team is looking into that as we speak. It doesn't matter how great her life was turning out to be, the storm was brewing, and one day Vera knocked on the wrong man's door. The house is in the rural area instead of the suburbs like Vera usually does her sales in. It is surrounded by tall oak and pine trees. It's old, the windows are yellow from years of sun blocking. She knocks on the door excited to finish her past-lived career with a bang. Her excitement gets erased off her face when she's hit with the funky smell radiating from inside the house. The stench must be so strong because Vera can't smell properly due to an incident with a baseball bat when she was 12. The smell is bad, but even that fails to prepare Vera for the sight in front of her. The man who opens the door can't possibly be human. The first thing she notices is his teeth, with the yellow and black overtaking his entire mouth. He has leftovers stuck in between them. His gray jogging pants look like he hasn't taken them off in years. He has a huge belly that makes Vera think you couldn't even find his manhood if you tried. Not that anyone ever would. One of his shoes has no shoelaces and the other one is partially exposed on the front. His big toenail is missing and all his other toes look infected. His once white undershirt now resembles his teeth. Curls of hair and dried skin can be seen covering his entire pits. His face is a nightmare to look at. Covered in large leaky pores with oily infected skin scabs and scratch marks all over it. His hair is comically long not because it's a style choice but because of negligence. It's held together because his natural oils and grime collecting in his scalp, his cockeyed. His left eye is pulled in the opposite direction and it seems like his nose bone might be blocking its line of vision to some extent. The right one is completely white. He is just sickening to look at. The guy is a total fucking slob.
But Vera doesn't let this nauseating sight to stop her from earning that bonus, so she still tries to do her best pitch. The man then gives the woman an unsettling smile and lets her inside, doesn't forget to lock the door behind him. She follows him upstairs into a bedroom. He gestures at the rug on the other side of the bed and says, Clean it. Vera walks towards the rug and gives a blood-curdling scream at the sight. What she sees is basically if you turned a woman into chunky vegetable soup and then dumped it on the floor. If not for the few distinguishable body parts, especially the head, you couldn't tell it's a person, or what's left of one, anyway. The scream doesn't humor the slob and he punches her into the ground and starts kicking. Then he points at the vacuum again and says, clean it. When he leaves the room, Vera jumps to her feet and looks for a way out or something to defend herself with, but the room has barred windows and barely much of anything inside it, so her next best option is to do what the slob said. She starts cleaning the rug as best as she can. The slob then returns with a plate. On it, there's a huge piece of meat still stuck to its bone. Vera refuses to eat it, not knowing what kind of meat it is or whose meat. Alright fellas, what I'm about to tell you right now is just very disturbing, very poopy things including multiple instances of graphic sexual assault and loss of a child in a violent way so just giving an extra warning here. I know you know what you're getting into but it might be more than you can handle or want to handle today so just in case, no one's gonna laugh at you. Like no one's gonna call you stupid weak baby. Alright, so don't be shy to skip some parts here. The next morning, the slob returns. He drags in a woman with a black garbage bag around her head. The slob looks at Vera and the plate that still has the meat on it. He extends the meat to her. She refuses his offer. So he slams her head against a headboard and renders her unconscious. When she wakes up, she's stripped down naked with her arms and legs restrained. All of a sudden, an unnatural feeling sets in. She can't see all the way down her body, but there's definitely something inside her. Because of its curves, she's pretty sure it's the bone she refused to eat. She then notices the slob standing over her, but before she can even look him in the face properly, he starts beating her again. Her nose is completely broken at this point, with her bridge bone sticking out, blocking her vision. The slob reaches for the meat bone and takes it out, wiggles it in front of Vera's face, taunting her, and says, Hungry now? She can't take the torture anymore, so she starts nibbling on the meat. But that doesn't satisfy him, so he starts putting pressure on her broken nose more and more, until Vera eats it all up like a rabbit dog, which results in her breaking some of her own teeth in the process. Then time comes for dessert. It's a three-course meal the slob is providing here. This hotel is just so glamorous. He takes a 25-pound dumbbell and starts slamming it onto Vera's pregnant belly, over and over again, then sticks his whole arm inside of her and pulls bloody pieces and then makes her eat it. The slob then plugs in the vacuum and starts pulling everything out from Vera. She passes out soon after that. She wakes up to whispers in the middle of the night. They're coming from the woman with the plastic bag around her head. She begs Vera to release her, but Vera isn't so trusting at first. The woman tells her that once Vera sees what she looks like, she'll have no doubt she's as much of a victim as she is. So Vera removes the bag, just to reveal a face that's been cut up to the point of no recognition. Her entire scalp is missing. Her lips have been removed, and I'm gonna let you guess where they are stitched now. Sandra is double-lipped up, as one would say. Despite the missing lips and skin around her mouth, her speech is as clear as it's ever been. After the woman is released, they exchange what little information they have on the man and this place. They're on a farm and there's a barn that the slob regularly takes women into and once he does, the woman never come back, says Sandra. But she says if he likes you, he keeps you around for longer, then squats down and starts pooping. A couple days before this happened, Sandra was taken down to the basement to help clean the butcher's block after the slob finished up carving woman. When he was out of the basement for a minute, Sandra searched one of the dead women who was still lying on the floor waiting to be chopped, and found a small key ring in the back of her jeans. I don't know how she got them, it's never mentioned in the book, but I'm guessing the woman stole them from the slob. 
Sandra swallowed the queuing in panic and now she's pooping it out. After fiddling with her poop and finding the keys, they shake hands to finish the slop together because they have a genius plan. Sandra is only 100% sure that one of the keys opens the gun case in the living room. She's not sure if there's anything in it, but if there is, then it must be a shotgun and that's gonna be their murder weapon. In order to get out of this room though, they decide to set up a murder scene, make it look like they took a slashing to one another. The slob is a moron, so they're sure he won't think on it much. They each cut themselves in the wrist to draw fresh blood and continuously stir their cups of blood to keep it from drying out with the, with the bone. You know the bone? That bone? When they hear him coming, they lay pretending to be dead with blood splashed on them. The slab doesn't question it, just drags Sandra out of the room. Quickly using the keys, Vera gets out of her shackles and makes her way downstairs, opens the gun case, loads the shotgun, and goes to find Sandra. She finds her still playing dead on top of a bed with the slob sexually assaulting her. As if this man is a tiny, little, fast-moving thing, Vera starts questioning her aim. She fears she might hit Sandra, so she decides to get closer. And when she's right behind him, aiming for his head, as if they suddenly decided to be freaking stupid together, Sandra takes out the bone she pretended she's been stabbed with and sticks it into the slob's eye. And during the process of him falling backwards, shots get fired and Sandra's face gets blown off. Vera is then taken to a cage where she's repeatedly violated for weeks. There's a chain around her neck that limits her movements. In the room with her, there's a giant meat grinder, a huge cooking mat, and dozens of corpses all stacked next to her, all women. In the cooking mat, there's even more being cooked. Then the bodies are put through the grinder, put into cans, and get stuck with labels that say TYG. One day with some of the new bodies, a young girl is brought in, and she has a Walkman hanging around her neck still. Rare puts the headphones on and misses with it, then lands on Beat It by Michael Jackson. Vera is sure that this is some kind of a divine message for her to beat the shit out of the slob. While MJ is blasting through the headphones, Vera starts collecting teeth from all the dead women, and then takes the forearm bone from one of them. Are you ready to hear what she's gonna do with them? Are you? Cause fellas, I was not. When the slob arrives and starts assaulting her, he falls back screaming, you were asking why, because Vera puts the forearm bone inside her vag, which then slices open his little pee-pee. And then when he's screaming, she shoves all the teeth into his mouth, which he chokes on. She then takes the keys from him and releases herself. She climbs up a ladder that ends on a platform, which is where he dumps the bodies into the cooking mat and the grinder. Vera takes the bone out of her cooch, and then the slob climbs the ladder and tries to get to her. She stabs him through the throat, upwards, impaling him in the little nut brain, and pushes him into the meat grinder. While he's grinning at her like a stupid idiot, Vera says her final goodbyes. You are what you eat. <laughs> you think I'm messing with you guys, but I'm really not. She says that. She really does say that with a straight face. <laughs> There's more. There's even more. Hold on. Vera then reaches home to her husband, Daniel, who's become a bit of a slob himself, alcohol and all. The first thing she says when she sees the house is, it's time to clean this mess up. No hospital. No help me. I'm freaking dying over here. No, I had to stab a guy with my coochie sword or anything. She's like, let's clean. Bitches, because that's normal. Then one day, like months after this, she goes to her gynecologist because she's having troubles getting horny with her husband. I wonder why. And her doctor says, Vera, you're pregnant. Guess whose baby it is? Guess, guess whose baby it is? Because it's not Daniel's. I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting? What? Oh, yeah. The ending. Soon after Vera leaves that place, a man comes in with an unconscious woman he drugged at a bar. 
When he sees the slab severed head sitting in the basement, he realizes what happened. So he shoots the woman he brought in and burns the whole place down, then goes to a mansion filled with gay men. But these gays are not your regular gays. These gays hate women because they can never be women, because they can never be loved by men like women are, because they are at the bottom of the food chain, because they like men fuzz, they like dingleberries, they like RuPaul's Drag Race, because they're gay. So they turn into an only woman diet because they think if they consume feminine features, they too will become pretty and be feminine like women. And they sell these canned human meats labeled tender young girls, and that's how they got rich. Now they're about to close a deal with a Yakuza leader who wants a bit of fresh meat for himself, but when the dude arrives, there's no meat because the druggie burned the whole place down. So they serve the Yakuza leader cured pepperoni pizza and he eats it. He eats it. But then he orders his men to kill the homosexuals by beheading them in the bathroom. And then they cook the homosexuals in pans and pots. And then they eat the homosexuals. They make burgers with their patties, noodle soup with their small intestines, shh kebab with their... <laughs> okay, this part isn't in the book. It just came straight from my heart, okay? They also eat their hearts, probably. But listen, they clean up after themselves. So I think they wouldn't mind. Or I think the gays are totally cool with this. I think they're fine with this arrangement. I mean, wasn't it... Listen, wasn't it the homosexuals who wanted to be a bunch of men's mule anyway? <laughs> I'm so proud of that joke. Okay, in this part, we're going to discuss some of the similarities I noticed in the writing and the contents of Playground and The Slob. At first, I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Then they just kept piling on. Some of you might call this a reach, some of you might agree it's totally fine, but they heavily affected my enjoyment of the book and I already wasn't enjoying it, so I want to mention them real quick before we move on. If you have not read Playground or watched the video I made on it, it's cool, you don't have to, I'm going to explain in a way you'll understand, but obviously it's going to spoil the whole thing. So if you want to experience the twists and turns in real time, I suggest you go read the book or watch the video and then come back to this one. While reading the sub, one of the things I immediately noticed was the vocabulary. The usage of words and terms are basically the same, from the way Beauregard would describe the graphic scenes to how he would describe the characters. There's about a two or three year difference between the publication of the two books, so being able to tell that the writing didn't improve was already a letdown for me. He doesn't know how to make his characters different from one another, everybody talks the same, and it's a huge problem that I'm gonna delve deeper into in part 3. Writing wasn't the only similarity. Of course, there's quite a few things that we can classify as kinks, which isn't something that's unheard of in the subgenre of horror, but the repetition is a killer of enjoyment, and it also makes me think he either chooses the easy way out by adding these in, or he's just adding his own kinks, and he's n it, it's not a smart book. It's a torture book. So that's just worrying to me. In Playground, a character named Lacey Matthews dies because of a neck chain trapping her into her seat, and in the slob, we see Vera wearing one while she's being tortured, trapped in a cage. In Playground, we read about the villain Geraldine Borden playing with her mother's poop, and in the slob, Sandra plays with her own poop. In Playground, a character pisses herself, and in the slob, there are multiple mentions of soiled underwear, piss-stained beds, or pissing oneself in general. In Playground, Geraldine Borden gets impaled through her genitals by a glass spear. In the slob, Vera is repeatedly sexually assaulted by a meat bone, so penetration with a foreign object exists in both books. Apart from these, there's also death by meat grinders in both books, and the issue of pregnancy also appears in both. Geraldine tortures people because she can't get pregnant, and Vera tries to make as much money as she can before her baby comes. It feels odd that both these women's driving force in the books is motherhood. It's their motive behind their actions. There's also a sequel to The Slob called The Son of the Slob, which I'm assuming is about Vera's kid, which means, again, pregnancy and motherhood are going to be the main points in the book. It feels like the women who have big parts in the stories are always put in this position, like Sandra had maybe five lines, so if we count her out, the adult women in both books were just mothers or wanted to be mothers. 
Making the villains gay is also a really interesting choice. I honestly didn't understand why Geraldine was gay in the book. It seemed so unnecessary. I always questioned why not her dad. You know, why isn't she desiring her dad instead of her mom, especially after she adopts a teen boy and not a teen girl, but then starts dreaming about a minor girl. She put the bi and bisexual in that book and I fucking hate it. In this one, again, the bigger villains, the operating villains are gay and again, it's such a messed up stereotype that because men like feminine things, it means that they want to be women. My working theory is that Beauregard saw RuPaul's Drag Race once and assumed they were gay wants to do drag. Like, I know dude was traumatized, okay? It just freaking comes out of nowhere, you know? It's weird. Another similarity that really grinded my gears, though, is that in both books, there's a husband who gets suspicious. In the slob, it's Vera wanting to become a door-to-door salesman to make some money for her family. In Playground, it's Molly Grimley wanting to let her kids play in a playground to make some money for her family. In both families, the husband gets suspicious. They have an argument. The husband complies because the wife is just so sure things are going to work out and this ultimately dooms the whole family and they lose their child slash children. That is just really interesting to me. Honestly, I wouldn't have noticed if it was one or two things. I know it's a splatter punk and it's going to have things I don't like inside. It, that's the point. But the author chose to write about these themes in the same way twice, which doesn't really make a good impression. I know this book wants to get a reaction out of me desperately. I know that. But I don't think the reaction it expected was mind-numbing boredom. If you're still here, I love you. There's a lot of things that annoyed me in this book, so for this part to make sense without me sounding like a babbling idiot frog, which I'm still gonna sound like, we're gonna tackle this by separating it into pointers, so bear with me for a second here. One thing I understood for certain is that Erin Beauregard does not know how to structure his books. I'm not only saying this because it was hard for me to structure these scripts in a way that doesn't confuse people. With Playground, he would start or end in the middle of a puzzle, which seemed odd. But I was like, whatever. I honestly thought it was his first book, so I gave him a pass. In the slob, the situation was really, really bad. And he had himself and two editors working on this book. So did no one. Not a single one of you. Not even a friend. Not someone in the publishing house. Like, no one worked up the courage to be like, hey, fellas, you know what I was thinking? Maybe we shouldn't put the illustrations at the beginning of each chapter because, you know, it ruins the whole thing. I mean, look at this. We leave this chapter before Vera discovers what's on the rug. And then the next chapter, boom, we just show the reader what's on the rug. And then we tell them, what's on the rug it just ruins the surprise you know it's not fun anymore to explain the reader in horrific details of what's on the rug when the reader already knows what's on the rug because because we show them what's on the rug i swear to you it's like this in every chapter the book spoils itself for no reason with these pictures like come on man is this wattpad what, are you showing us what god-awful dress YN is wearing to the party? Why are you doing this? This is just insanity. At least Playground had the decency to show the images after the explanation. Like, you're supposed to horrify me with your writing? You're supposed to create suspense, and you do. Okay, I gotta give it to you. You do. You leave the chapters at high-tension moments, but then you just go and ruin it. This is like self-sabotage. And that's not even the only way. Like, look at this one. Again, we leave the chapter at Vera is about to find out what's on the carpet, right? Then we get spoiled at the start of next chapter. And then we have to read about how she lost her sense of smell for some reason. And then we finally read about what's on the carpet. What is this? Did no one proofread this? What were those editors doing, bro? Vera already mentioned how she can smell properly when the slob opened the door. So instead of telling us about the accident with the baseball bat then when you had already mentioned it, when it would have made perfect sense to explain it, you chose to explain it now. Then again, he does the same thing with the images. We don't know whether or not the gun case has a gun inside. 
We don't know. It's creating suspense. It's creating tension. Because what if there isn't? Then what's the plan? What are these women gonna do? Two small women against a giant wet smelly blob. What's gonna happen? So why are you showing us the shotgun before Vera gets to the shotgun? I'm gonna lose my mind. Then again with the drugged woman being shot and the fire and the gay men getting killed. Why did you show them? Like, why not put the images after you say what you gotta say? Why not? Give me one reason, bro. Give me one good reason. The worst part is that people have read this. People have looked at this. And people have said, yeah, this looks dope. Let's release it. This is absolutely baffling to me. It's such an easy thing to avoid. It's so easy. You'll, you'll literally have to have read books before to not make this mistake you don't need any kind of writing experience you don't need any kind of editing experience for this you don't it's so easy to avoid but you didn't multiple times you didn't why what did you pay your editors a piece of gum for this that they had to share in half because <laughs> how can you have two editors and yourself working on this book and still make such errors like this one I already mentioned having a limited vocabulary and how it's actually a huge deal, but let's talk about that more. When you're writing a book and you don't try to give all your characters different vocabularies and different speech patterns, then all your characters are going to sound the same. Like, you don't even have to look far to know I'm right. Just look at your text messages with your friends. Alright, every single one has a different way of saying the same thing. The memes they use are different. The adjectives they use are different. Maybe they write gibberish like me because their brain goes brrrr all the time and they can't catch up sometimes. Or even just look at this video. I'm sure you notice I like saying bro or fellas a lot. It's a problem. I'm not dealing with it. I like it. So if we didn't have these characteristics in our speech, then we would all sound the same. If the dialogue in this book was just given to you like this with no names shown, you wouldn't know these are two different people. They talk the same. People aren't like that. That's like one of the most fun parts of reading a book, to be able to look at a page and know immediately which character is speaking, to be able to grow familiar with the characters, to recognize their patterns. In the slob, there's just one pattern, and it is the most monotone one you could possibly find, except when it's foreigners. When the only distinguishing feature in someone's speech or dialogue is their accent or broken English, that means your characters don't have unique voices unless they're foreign, which means you might not only come off as a bad writer, but also a racist. There's a Japanese dude in this book who speaks with broken English, but the American girl with no lips, with half of her brain leaking out, can recite you the constitution with perfect English without even slurring her words. She has no lips, I repeat. No lips. No lips. You could have at least tried to talk without smashing your lips together to see if that's even possible. Try seeing racism, but your lips can touch each other. Try it. Alright, imagine saying your character is into paleontology, but you don't know shit about paleontology. So you just write him like a regular dude who never talks about dinosaurs or fossils, he never mentions Jurassic Park, he never cracks a really unfunny, really nerdy joke like someone gets shot in the book and he doesn't go, well that was a big bang now, wasn't it? You don't even mention dino nuggies. And then you still want your readers to believe that your character really loves dinos. Who's gonna believe you, broski? No one. In the same way, you can't write a character who's a romantic without them swooning over cheesy rom-coms or expressing their annoyance with them because maybe they're a different kind of romantic. Maybe they're not standing outside your house with a boombox over my head kind of romantic, but they're if I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more kind of romantic. Who are we to assume you're supposed to tell this to us? You can't write an astrology girly without her talking about or making references to, you know, astrology stuff like crystals and the moon. See, I don't know shit about astrology, so it doesn't work. I expect you to do your research as a writer. OCD is not mentioned in the book, even though it's obvious that Vera does have it. She cleaned her home when she was a kid, she works as a hotel maid, she talks about how she likes her environment a certain way. The first thing she says when she sees her house after she's been through all kinds of torture and abuse for weeks is let's clean, so she has OCD. 
The author not mentioning the term makes me think he wanted to have a pass for not doing his research about OCD. Obsessive compulsive disorders aren't really things you can turn on and off when there's something bigger happening in your life. People who are obsessed with cleaning will think about cleaning, even in their happiest or saddest moments. They'll think about it even when they're in distress. When Vera's chained into a filthy cage or a filthy room, she doesn't have racing thoughts about how filthy it is, which a person with OCD would have. She would even have racing thoughts after being violated by a filthy man and would really struggle to not think her insides are also filthy now. We don't see any of this in Vera's inner monologue, so why did you give her trauma and a mental disorder? Just so that you could have a reason for her to become a vacuum salesman? That's so shallow. This book really tests your limits of suspension of belief, just wants to see how far you're willing to go because you mean to tell me. After smashing a pregnant woman's belly in so hard that there's a dent in her body and removing chunks of her baby and most definitely reproductive organs of the vacuum, that woman is still able to become pregnant. He also wants us to believe that the woman could stick a forearm bone inside her vag. It's a bone. It's an 11 inches bone. 11 into 11 inch for our friends who use the metric system that's 28 centimeters 28 centimeters what are you even talking about it's a bone not a pp not a dildo what are you talking about he also wants us to believe that a woman could see his captor assaulting her friend and just stop to examine his tiny teeny infected thumb looking pain the author describes the slob's pp three different times in this book why are you obsessed with this man's pee-pee? I read a book once where there was a woman with a haunted vagina, and her veg was basically a gateway to the land of the dead, and she sucks her boyfriend in to investigate to see what's popping, and then while he's still inside her, she has sex with another guy, and her boyfriend is inside her veg trying to stay alive swimming in this other dude's slimy bebes. To me, that book is more believable than this. At least that book owned up to the absurd and bizarre. You just want me to act clueless. You just want me to go along with it and I freaking refuse. You know there are male authors who are able to write female characters and you wouldn't even feel like you need to question the author's gender because women are written like normal human beings. Well Erin Beauregard is not one of those authors. Erin wants us to believe that a woman who has been through that much torture at the hands of a man could so nonchalantly say this after that same man Vomit, minced woman meat all over her cut up face while she's also being sexually assaulted by him at the same time. I was choking on the braised babes. In what world? The thing about graphic sexual assault revenge stories like this one that as a woman, when I'm reading them, by the time I get to the revenge part, I'm just so exhausted that revenge doesn't even feel good. I don't have the energy to celebrate anymore because what's been done is done and I witness horrible things and that's not gonna change. I don't feel triumphant. I feel used because it's another woman violated. And you expect me to have a reaction to this other than disgust. Of course I'm gonna be disgusted by sexual assault. When you read graphic descriptions of it, people either get disgusted or excited. So you're either choosing the easy way out to disturb people or you're writing for people who should be put in a meat grinder. So which one is it? While reading these kind of stories, you know that it's fiction, but you also know that revenge is more fiction than sexual assault is. Sexual assault happens all the time. Maybe it happened to you, maybe it happened to someone you know, it happened to strangers you catch the eye of on the train, at a cafe, on the streets, or maybe you just read about it on the news. Well, you definitely read about it on the news. But revenge isn't common, and when it happens in real life, the survivor isn't really applauded for surviving, they're punished for it, they're blamed for it. So sexual assault, even if it's fictional, takes something from you, something that revenge doesn't give you back. That is my main problem with these kind of stories. The fiction of sexual assault is one of the most common ways of exploitation of female bodies in horror media, it can be shown happening to anyone, obviously, you'd have to be a complete moron to not know that, but you'd also have to have no media literacy, no awareness of the world we live in to not know that most of the time the victim is a woman, especially in movies with gore and apparently in books with gore as well. Women get preyed on or murdered in sexual ways when they don't need to be, and penetration with a foreign object exists in, in both books 
that only being done to women tells you a lot too. And these foreign objects always gotta be huge. Glass spear for armbone. I wouldn't say much about this because yeah, they're being tortured. But since the author used this word to describe a dead woman's head, I kind of have a feeling this is more than just descriptions. And this is more than just fictional torture. This is something the author enjoys. And we are the ones being tortured to read about his fantasies. I don't think anyone with half a brain cell can come up to me and say that graphic depiction of sexual assault is done in order to raise awareness, to show how bad the act is, and not for the creeps who lurk on online forums collecting these materials so that they have something to jerk off to every night, and just really, really wholeheartedly believe that that's true. Let's not kid ourselves. It's overused, and even if it had some sort of a changing effect on people's minds once, although I doubt it, it's long gone now. No creep is gonna read how wet and shiny the meat bone stuck inside a woman looks and think, yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that to women. She seems quite upset about it, about the bone, just because you wrote about the woman crying when she's being violated. So these books are exploitative in nature. We need to grow up and accept that, but especially this book, because it says nothing. It does nothing with all that trauma. We read about this woman wanting to escape her prison just so that she can be the perfect wife and the perfect mother. That's why she wants to leave. We read this over and over and over again. It's like the sole purpose of a woman is to be just those two things. She doesn't want to leave because she doesn't want to be tortured anymore. She doesn't want to leave because she wants her family back. She wants her whole life back. No, she wants to leave because she wants to serve to her husband and to her kid. The book even has the nerve to make a woman feel upset after experiencing countless assaults, not because of those assaults, but because her husband feels unloved since they're not able to have sex anymore. And that man is shown as the good guy throughout the entire book. I couldn't recall exactly how many times he slammed my head, but it ached like a Robert Downey Jr. hangover. <laughs> Alright fellas, listen. I went into this book expecting graphic scenes, so I can't complain there were graphic scenes. My complaint is with the scenes having no purpose. Just to clarify that once more, I know I'm gonna read disgusting stuff. But expecting a well-developed story that goes with that is my right as a reader. I was disappointed. And it would be a disservice to punk culture if I said this book has punk in it. It is just a platter. It's pointless score that doesn't say anything in the end. It doesn't riot. It doesn't revolt. It doesn't challenge. It just bores you to death with meaningless prose. Filled with an insane amount of unnecessary metaphors, allegories, and stereotypes. I regret giving the author a second chance because reading the book was just a waste of time for me. I don't believe that Splatter Punk has to be trashy, that it has to be bad. Beauregard might have interesting ideas and concepts, and I really do think he does, but he fails at the execution and comes off as an edgelord instead. His books are like watching Live Leak. There's just so much violence happening back to back, but because there's no complexity to the characters other than their surface level trauma that isn't even brought up in crucial times or gets resolved at the end, then you become desensitized to the violence at some point. And that should not happen with these kind of books. We should be horrified every step of the way. It's a horror book. It's not a jump scare. And you could even argue that the first jump scare in a movie keeps the audience on the edge of their seat since they're anticipating more to come. The only thing I was anticipating while reading The Slob was for it to end sooner than I thought. The protagonists in the book are not well written, so you can't sympathize with them, you just don't feel anything for these characters. The worst of the worst happened to them, but they feel like cardboard cutouts more than actual human beings, so the traumatizing events they go through doesn't make a difference. The villains' motives are comical, they're just too over the top for you to even hate them, but they're not over the top in a fun way. This book is on the both edges of Splatter and Bizarro. It doesn't know what it wants to be, so the whole thing ends up falling flat. Like all of those metaphors and allegories, but he couldn't make the slob a metaphor for all the messed up shit men have done to women since the dawn of time and still continue to do so, 
and a woman finally putting an end to that suffering by taking the head of the dude who was the embodiment of misogyny with the help of other women whose tortured bodies have been stacked up which symbolizes all the layers of pain that we women have built in our bodies and you don't even need to end it on a good note make it nihilistic make the baby be the vicious cycle returning make it make sense i really really did not enjoy this book i'm not sure if you can tell <laughs> I'm still not going to make Beauregard the scapegoat for human atrocities, even though I don't like the guy as far as I know who he is by reading his books. I guess I'm a nice person. He's not the first guy to write a bad female character or a bad exploitation book, and he's not going to be the last one, unfortunately. Anyway, tell me what you thought of the book. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let's discuss in the comments. Also, we are shelving Beauregard for the time being to explore other authors and possibly other mediums and genres, but if you guys really want it, you just might convince me. Let's, again, talk in the comments. You know what? Honestly, all said and done, I think it could have been worse. I think it could have been so much worse. At least he didn't start his book with that good old, I was getting ready for school, putting my long brown hair in a messy bun. As I looked at my blue eyes in the mirror, my mom came in. I sold you to pay our debts, she said. Come meet your new master. I went downstairs, and there he was. Here's Styles. 